Okay, hello. I am Carrie Widener. I'm from the University of Bristol, and I'm going to tell you about some work that I've done with my uh, collaborators, Sophie Shermer at Swansea, Frank Longbein at Cardiff, and Edmund Jonquier, who's at USC in the US. And this is a presentation on our manuscript, which is uh, entitled Applying Classical Control Techniques to Quantum Systems, Entanglement versus Stability Margin, and Other Limitations. So let's just go right into it. The talk will be organized as follows. Um, first, I will motivate what's going on. I will describe the system, which is that of two qubits in a lossy cavity. Um, I am a physicist, and so I will explain this mostly from the physics point of view, because I believe that the control mathematics that are used here are not too out of hand. Um, and so it's best to make sure that a control-based audience understands the physics that's going on here. I'll also discuss the performance me measures considered here, also from a very physics background, trying to explain what's going on. And then I will talk about bounding the steady state error of the system and the concordance discordance of our various performance measures, which will lead to the overall conclusion that basically more work needs to be done on robust quantum control. So classical robust control theory is well established, but it is marginally successful when applied in general to quantum mechanical systems. There are some exceptions to this rule, however, for quantum systems, you have typically a closed or unitary um, evolution. And in this case, the poles are purely imaginary. They lie on the imaginary axis. Um, the system is governed by the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, which I have written here, where H is the Hamiltonian of the system and psi is by quantum state, which is written in Brockton form. This basically just represents a vector. Open quantum systems, are subject to decoherence and dissipation. This is typical for most real quantum systems that exist in the world. And this will actually push our system with the eigenvalues into the left half of the plane. Um, and the system is now described instead of a, a ket or a vector by a density matrix, which I'll denote here rho, which is governed here by this Lindblad equation, where I've got the uh, unitary Hamiltonian evolution here, you just take these terms, this is the uh, equivalent to this. Um, and then you've got this non-unitary evolution that's governed by these operators, V sub K. And you see it's non-unitary because there's no I up front. Uh, but unfortunately, these systems do retain a zero eigenvalue that's due to the trace constraints and the fact that the trace of our density matrix has to be unity. And you can say, oh, well, we're done here because we can just push the, uh, the poles of our system onto the left half of the plane, but there you one risks losing the quantumness of the system. Um, and so it's really that, that unitary behavior that gives us that quantum advantage that we're trying to find. And many quantum performance measures are nonlinear, like entanglement measures, we'll discuss one later on in this talk, and things like squeezing measures and whatnot. And most of the time, physicists really just sort of hit this with the Monte Carlo hammer. Um, via you know, Monte Carlo sampling of a control and they look at the spread and their fidelities or whatnot, and they say, ah, yes, this is or is not robust. But we should really try to find the fundamental limits that are imposed by control. And the goal for this work is really not to present any amazing results, but actually quite the opposite, to present some results that are somewhat puzzling that then motivate the need for a general theory of robust quantum control. So our system here is two qubits in a lossy cavity, which I've got illustrated down here. Um, this is inspired by some work by Matsui et al., which is published in PhysRev A. Um, if you have any questions about this system, you can definitely go in here. Um, and it defines basically two qubits with transition frequencies omega-1 and omega-2, and a, a cavity resonance frequency omega-D, which defines a detuning, which is the detuning of omega-1 or omega-2 from our cavity. Uh, the qubits are driven with some amplitude, um, alpha L, which this basically tells us, um, for example, how much light we have in our cavity that are, that's driving the qubits. And there's this cavity coupling kappa, um, but the cavity can be somewhat annoying. So we perform instead a unitary transformation that adiabatically eliminates the cavity. And so that really gets rid of this kappa term and whatnot. 
And the cavity really remains in the system via this collective qubit coupling term that takes the form of a dissipative coupling. Um, and it's this S1 sigma one minus plus S2 sigma two plus, which you can see illustrated down here. And this is collective. I want to emphasize this. This is not the same as just having two isolated qubits. And it's because you have to treat this term collectively. And the system evolution is governed by the Lindblad master equation, which I popped up a few slides below, where our Hamiltonian is basically describing the absorption and emission of uh, photons from the uh, qubits. And then we have this uh, detuning term that's describing how each qubit is uh, basically coupling to the light, how that's changing with the detuning of the light. And this is summing over qubits one and two. Um, and then we've got this collective coupling term that I'm, that's interesting, as well as the uh, decoherence term, the sigma z operator for each qubit, and a decay term, the sigma minus term for each qubit, um, where this is describing the decay, for example, from the excited state down to the ground state. Great. So what we do is we solve this in the block representation, where we go from density matrices to vectors. And because this density matrix describing two qubits is four by four, these vectors are going to have 16 elements. And that corresponds to a basis of 15 traceless Hermitian operators on a Hilbert space with dimension four. And combined with the identity operator, this gives us 16 operators. And we'll call these the new sub k. And you can see the details in the manuscript. But what this allows you to do is get a 16 by 16 matrix A that describes the system dynamics. Um, and so basically, this is a fairly straightforward system to solve. And it's, you know, finding the steady state, for example, can be seen to be reasonably trivial. Um, well, not trivial, but it can be done. And it is very straightforward because of this basis to go between rho and r. Um, and it's also very straightforward to find the steady state of the system. And because we're looking at robustness, we're looking at perturbations. So we describe a bare steady state, rho steady state, as a function of our perturbation magnitude delta. Um, and our bare system is just rho ss at 0. And the system has bare parameters that look like this, where basically we have the two qubit drive terms, the two qubit detuning terms. And then these are the coupling terms, uh, the collective coupling terms, as well as our dephasing and our decay. You see that we set our dephasing and decay all to be zero. And basically, we have, uh, we're driving and collectively coupling this, these two qubits, and the detunings are anti symmetric with one another. And the perturbations, where we have a notation that's similar to a paper that we recently published in the Transactions on, on Automatic Control, um, are uh, this, is, this is basically giving us a consistent notation with that manuscript. Um, we look at the qubit two system because it's symmetric with the qubit one system and this just simplifies our analyses. But we have the perturbation to qubit two driving and then you see detuning, a symmetric and an anti-symmetric perturbation to this collective coupling, as well as a perturbation to qubit two decay and decay. And we can actually study the effect of these perturbations, but we need to have a performance measure upon which to judge how good we are doing. And we consider the performance measure of the concurrence. And this is effectively our entanglement. Um, so this concurrence is a number that's a function of our uh, perturbation that lies between 0 and 1. And it's got this uh, description that is admittedly somewhat disgusting, and obviously not linear, because we've got square roots of our density matrix and whatnot. You can dive into the details of this offline, but it's effectively a measure of entanglement where we have a fully entangled state if we have uh, our concurrence equal to one. Um, for example, one can show that a Bell state has unity concurrence. And for our bare state that we've considered and I've popped up on the previous slide, we have 99.5% or 0.995 uh, concurrence. So this is a fairly entangled state. And then we also have the fidelity of our steady state as a function of delta relative to our steady state at zero perturbation. And so this is just the trace of rho SS at zero um, relative to rho SS at delta. We also have the state purity, um, which is again a number between zero and one, which is basically the uh, square, basically the trace of the square of your density operator. And our bare state is indeed pure. 
So it has unity, purity. Um, this gives you an idea of how mixed your state is with its environment. And the environment is then denoted via these uh, V sub Ks in the Lindblad terms that I put on the previous slide. We also have this so-called classically inspired stability margin, which I'll call here G, which is the maximum of the real part of the eigenvalues of our A matrix, ignoring that zero eigenvalue. Um, and this is corresponding to a given steady state. Um, and basically we have for our bare state that G at zero is 0 0.01. So that's our uh, stability margin. And so what we can do is we can look at these uh, perturbations as a function of delta. We can look at our, our, different, um, our different performance measures where we have the purity with the solid lines to con one minus the concurrence. So this is the concurrence error with the dashed line and then one minus fidelity, the fidelity error with our dotted lines on the uh, left axis. And then on the right axis, you can see the classic stability margin. And I don't really have the time to dig into this in a whole lot of detail. Um, so you can look at the manuscript offline and you can stare at it. But what you can see is that actually for uh, perturbations to the driving and to the different gammas, our decoherence and our decay, you know, these are very much, uh, for example, our concurrence error and our fidelity error are very much concurrent with our, uh, are very much concordant with our stability, uh, stability margin. But there are cases where this really isn't the case. For example, if you look at the detuning, something funny happens around uh, the point where the detuning of qubit one is equal to the detuning of qubit two. If you remember from the pre uh, previous slide, these were basically anti-symmetric with one another for the bare state. Um, and then you know the, the cavity coupling and the symmetric and the anti-symmetric cavity couplings, you know, there are some strange things happening here. And so it can be difficult by looking at these to glean any sort of physical insight. And that's really the point of what we're trying to say here is that looking at these perturbations, it can be, it's not straightforward to look at it and say, ah, oh, what's going on? You do have to stare and think. So let's look at this from a control perspective. I'll go through this fairly quickly because it should be reasonably elementary. Um, in general, the block matrix and the structured perturbation matrix take, take on these forms. Um, where we've got this bottom row of zeros here. Um, and basically given the perturbation delta, we can actually take, uh, we can look at the, we can bound the steady state error, which is given here by this Z of delta as the limit as us goes to zero, basically of something that's related to the transfer function. And then this S R sub S, which is basically less than or equal to the norm of the transfer function at zero perturbation and then the norm of this uh, vector D, where basically uh, you can see how D is described down here. And we take T, Z, comma, R at delta and S to be the delta function, or sorry, the transfer function that takes us from R to Z. So, good. We can then plot this again for our different perturbations, where we've got the concurrence error and the yellow dash dotted lines. We've also got the norm of our Z, and the norm of our transfer function as a function of delta plotted here. And again, for S2, S7, and S9, basically our driving and then our de uh, decoherence and decay, these look fairly concurrent. But again, funny things are happening, especially to our transfer function at various points here for S4 and S10. And so there is something physically going on here, but it's not, easy to say sort of what's going on in terms of, for example, the control, because these poles that I'm seeing here in my T and my Z don't really show up with my concurrence, which seems to be, you know, happily moving forward uh, for S4 and S10. Um, the point here, again, is not to sit here and stare and distill what's going on, but just to show that what's going on in the control system and what's going on in the performance measures that we, with the control mathematics rather, and what's going on in the performance measures that we actually care about, you know, none, of, none of this is really telling the whole story. So in order to take another look at this, we did some, uh, we looked at the concordance and the discordance uh, via the Kendall Tau analyses. Um, and so we did this and we can plot it here for the various perturbations where we have again, driving, detuning, this is the symmetric S5 and the anti-symmetric S10 cavity couplings and S7 and S9 or our uh, decoherence and decay. 
And so you can see for S2, S7, and S9, we've got you know fairly nice concordances. S4 looks okay. Um, and so you can see these are basically the G is the classical stability margin, one minus C, concurrence error, so on and so forth. And so this notation uh, looks good. But for example, for these cavity coupling terms, which really is where the interesting physics comes into the problem, you don't see super concordant behavior. And actually for some of these, you see very discordant behavior, for example, between the concurrence error and the norm of this Z vector that I put on the previous slide. And so this isn't a, there's no universal concordance, although there is sort of general concordance between these different measures. And this is really the point in that it obviates the need for more detailed work and a general theory. So I'll close this off by mentioning that really these results show that a more general theory is necessary. And recent work of ours has shown the efficacy of a robustness and infidelity measure, which we call the RIM, in determining the robustness of quantum controllers. Um, and so this is really nice. We've put this up on the archive and it's currently under review. Likewise, we have another paper that's up on the archive and under review that's thought about, wait, in a control setting, actually for quantum control, we don't care too much about the frequency response, but rather the time domain response. Because as a physicist, what I care about very much is the state transfer from one state to another, but I want it to happen as fast as possible. And so if you say, ah, yes, in the steady state, it does this, but it takes two years to get to the steady state. I don't really care that much because by that point, the fact that it's a quantum system that is quite fragile, um, basically by that point, everything that I care about, everything that truly makes the system quantum will have decayed. Um, and so, yes, uh, the point here is that more work remains to be done. And indeed, as a physicist, I can see that there's a need to bridge, bridge the gap between the control and the physics communities. And my, uh, my co-authors here agree with me. So we're working on that as well. Thank you for your time. And I hope you have a wonderful time in Cancun. Cheers.